Thank you everyone for uh, joining the Magnet Seminars this week um, and it's another, another uh, good turnout so thank you very much for the community support. Um, just a very quick reminder about the uh, seminar formats. We have a sort of 20, uh, 25 to 30 minute presentation. Uh, I kindly ask that everybody keeps their microphones muted so as not to interrupt the presenter. Um, following that we'll have a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and answer session. Um, we'll invite you to unmute your microphones and ask an oral question. Uh, if you don't want to, to ask a question um, in person, uh, you can add the question to the chat. Uh, if you just simply put no mic, then either myself or one of the co-hosts will be able to uh, read out the question for you. Um, and as always, if you have to just get up and go halfway through the seminars, please just get up and go. We've got life going on all around us. And at the end of the session, we'll have time for a bit of a, a catch up with everybody. Uh, and that part of the, uh, the seminar will not, be, will not be recorded. So it's a, a bit more of a relaxed environment. And so today our speaker, I'll hand over to our speaker, Adrian Muxworthy, who will be presenting on diagenesis and magnetic uh, signals of hydrocarbons. Good, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, Okay, so I'm Adrian Maxwell from Imperial College. Um, I run the Natural Magnetism Group and I'll be talking about work that we've been doing over the last decade. It's something I've not really talked about personally with this community. Some of my students over the years have done that, but I haven't given a talk on this particular topic to uh, the, sort of the, the paleomagnetic community or geomagnetic community. Um, so this is work has been done with um, Al Fraser, who's worked for BP for I guess about 30 years in exploration and now he works at university. Uh, Mark Sefton who's a organic uh, geochemist and with a range of uh, former and current uh, PhD students whose names are up there on the screen. You might have met some of them at various meetings over the last few years. So I'm going to be talking about the magnetic signature of uh, hydrocarbons. Um, now, we're not the first people to do that, and I guess the sort of first motivational paper came out in 1917. I'm not going to spend too long talking about the history of this, but just a little bit to give some idea of the motivation. Um, the first paper came out in 1979, where a paper by Donovan, who did an aeromagnetic survey over an oil field called Cement Field. I'm not quite sure why it's called Cement Field in Oklahoma. And they detected magnetic anomalies. So that got the sort of mineral or rock magnetists interested in what might be causing that. And over the last few decades, a number of um, academics from various places around the world, particularly people like Doc Elmore and groups in Venezuela, they've looked, trying to link uh, magnetic anomalies, trying to understand these magnetic anomalies and trying to tie them to hydrocarbons. So here we've got this group, a study from, nine, from 2000 from the group in Venezuela, and they've got three cores, um, the two on the left are above hydrocarbon reservoirs and the one on the one on the, the right is not and you can see there's these these spikes in the susceptibility and the, the, the values of susceptibility are much higher so there's clearly sort of some kind of link going on between the presence of hydrocarbons in in the ground and the magnetic um, magnetization the magnetic signal of rocks um, it's been documented for a long time now. There's a picture from Doug Elmer from 1987. You get these wonderful uh, framboids of iron oxides and iron sulfides. And he, he was, we've got a picture on the right taken by a former student of mine, Stacy Emerton. And this is on the, on the one of the riders of a nice framboid of, uh, of, of gregite. Um, and this is another sort of... Uh, magnetic uh, response that we kind of see in association with hydrocarbons. In addition to that, uh, uh, Hans Mackel, who's one of our collaborators, and uh, Liz Burton did a whole bunch of thermodynamic modeling in the early to mid 90s, where they looked at iron oxides and iron sulfides and siderite in the presence of various hydrocarbon systems at a range of depths and pressures. And they showed how the different minerals would form and change depending on the conditions. So there's a whole wealth of background um, in literature before we started 
looking at this problem. Okay, so I'm not starting from scratch. Well, one of the things, even though there's been a lot of work done, there wasn't really a clear link between the magnetic melanger and the hydrocarbons. There have been various studies, but they're often related to various kind of aspects of uh, you know being case studies. So we see some trends in one place, but we wouldn't see it in the other place. And we want to try and make something a bit more unified. And then can we use these magnetic signals as a proxy to understand hydrocarbon systems? So I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk too much about sort of background geology, but just a little bit here. Um, what, how does oil form? If you have a sediment that's full of organic material, it gets buried. When it gets down to about three kilometers or so, it starts to form into oil. If you go deeper, it forms into gas. Of course, oil and gas are light molecules, so they want to go up, so they try and escape from where they're deep places and go, go upwards towards the surface, so they then migrate along through typically um, porous rock, plastic rocks like sandstone until they get trapped by an impermeable layer and you get a range of different kinds of traps. You can have anticlines, false, there's a whole range of different types of, of uh, traps and of course the, the gas is lighter than the oil so you tend to get gas on the top and you get oil and underneath you typically get uh, maybe get some water so you get these different types of contacts and I'll be talking about contacts a little bit later on. So this is the kind of system we're looking at. We also have to worry about biodegradation of the oil because this has been shown to affect the magnetic mineralogy. So as the oil gets towards the surface, so um, as the temperature drops below about 80 degrees Celsius, then it's possible for bacteria to live. They, they quite like this hydrocarbons and they, they essentially um, destroy it, they degrade the quality of it. And in the process, some of these bacteria can produce uh, uh, magnetite particles, as in this picture here, and some of them can destroy the magnetization. So it's something else we need to consider when we're looking at the magnetic response of a hydrocarbon system. Now, I'm going to talk about some examples of some work that we've done, and I, I didn't, this is only the second time I've been to one of these talks, and I didn't realize it was only supposed to be 25 minutes, so I might just cut off, just do the first three bits, and take the then go, on to the end. Okay, so what well, are the things that we, these are the sort of things we've been doing over the last 10 years at Imperial. And what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the oil kitchen. This is the part where the oil um, forms. Okay, so if we're going to use magnetization as a proxy, we need to have some kind of idea um, how these magnetic particles are being formed. Are they being formed as the fluid? Uh, passes through the rock, some sort of, so the minerals are formed in situ, in place, or are they actually transported with the oil itself? So we did a series of pyrolysis experiments to see if oil, if when oil forms, whether magnetic particles form as well, and whether these particles are small enough to be transported with the oil. So pyrolysis is essentially what we're doing is we're reproducing what we see in the environment. We're creating pressures and temperatures which are enough to generate um, oil. So we're going to essentially going to make oil in the lab, and this is, this process is called pyrolysis. And to do that, we need we need a source rock. So we're quite lucky in London, which is just about here, that we're about two hours drive from the Wessex Basin, which is the probably the best example of an onshore um, oil uh, hydrocarbon system in Europe, so people, not just people from the UK, but people from elsewhere will, will come to this, this area to study hydrocarbon systems. And if you go down to the beach, there's a, all the way along the beach here, you get the sandstone outcrops, and uh, you can see, you can see all this, all this, uh, the sand here, the sandstone. And if you look at this, you probably think this is wet, and it is wet, but it's actually oil. oil. If you actually go there, the oil is literally just dribbling out of the rocks at the side there. It's so rich in oil. Now, clearly, if we want an immature source rock, we want some of the rock that hasn't actually been buried or isn't contaminated by the oil. So, obviously, we've got our immature source rock from somewhere else, but it's, it's this famous Kimmeridge clay and blue lias and Oxford clay, which are full of organic content. And we made oil in the laboratory. Now, we haven't got geological time scales, so we have to cheat a little bit. And by cheating, we have to speed up the reaction. To speed up the reaction, we go to higher temperatures. So in nature, this would typically be happen at 100 degrees, say, or something like that. We went up to 200 degrees to see what happens to the magnetization. 
uh, to, to generate the magnetic properties on a time scale which is uh, more you know more human so we can three or four days is typically what we're looking at so here we have hysteresis loops of a sample so we've taken the unheated sample as a history you can't really see it because there's nothing to see it's completely flat there's no magnetization whatsoever then when we did the pyrolysis experiment at 250 degrees we generated this curve here so we've generated all these ferromagnetic minerals and when we did it at an even higher temperature we find that we had uh, even more uh, well we had different type of magnetic minerals and we're at a slightly higher temperature and i should stress that these are at artificially high temperatures so the Potentially, the minerals that we're producing might not be exactly the same as what might happen in nature because we're doing these at artificially high temperatures. But the idea is that magnetic particles can be generated. So here we have a graph of saturation magnetization from the hysteresis loops. And this is the, this is the unheated immature sample. This is MS for three different source rocks, immature rocks. And this is the, the response, and these are the temperatures at which we did the pyrolysis. And so here we have these iron sulfide minerals. When you go to a certain level at 300, you're going to drop to zero. But then above that, we start producing iron oxide minerals. So clearly, we can produce this, um, produce lots of magnetic minerals. And when we try and measure the magnetic properties to try and get an idea of the grain size, we see that we have lots and lots of very, very small particles of the order of 30 nanometers. Now you might think we've only got small particles because we've done these experiments very quickly and in nature because you've got more time you end up with much larger particles but as you'll see later on these very small particles of the order of 30 nanometers or less than 30 nanometers are very very typical in the natural systems as well. Just to verify that we have these very small particles we did some transmission electron microscopy and we managed to find quite a lot of these little uh, nanoparticles is 20 nanometers and I think this was a an iron sulfide uh, mineral. So this was part of uh, a PhD student Rebu's PhD thesis and we showed this accelerated pyrolysis produces these nanoparticles and these nanoparticles importantly are small enough to pass through uh, the pore spaces in a typical sandstone. So typically when you're looking at things less than 100 nanometers, so 30, less than 30 nanometers is much less than this critical limit. So the potential for the, the magnetic particles to be generated in the oil kitchen actually to migrate with the oil itself. Later on, another PhD student of mine, Shopi, was keen to test the idea that the oil particle, these magnetic particles are actually within the oil. So he got a he got some samples from the, the North Sea, and this is an area we'll be talking about a little bit uh, further later on when we talk about his PhD work. Um, but I thought I'd just bring this in now. So we had a pure oil sample from the North Sea. We wanted to mix it in something so we could measure it. So we mixed it in this kaolinite clay. And you can see this is the background signal. And when we put the oil in the kaolinite clay, measured it on a, on a squid magnetometer and did low temperature magnetometry, you can see we've got these different minerals. But the main thing to see is that the magnetization is significantly higher. We've got values of roughly 100 times higher in the oil sample. So the oil samples are able to actually contain the magnetic particle phases when they're of this size. Okay, so one of the main things we've been doing over the last um, five or six years is trying to see if we can use this magnetic signal to track migration. Now, my, hydrocarbon migration in oil reservoirs is actually something that's quite hard to do. And a lot of actually oil companies is, uh, etc. They're just more interested in finding where the oil is. They're not always that particular about how the oil actually gets there. Now, if you want to increase yield from mature oil fields, um, then it's, it's probably a very good idea to understand the migration. So rather than having to do explore and exploit new oil fields in new parts of the world, you can keep um, extracting oil from existing oil fields. So understanding migration is quite a key uh, problem uh, to, to try and tackle. So we've kind of shown that nanoparticles can probably migrate. And also there's lots of uh, literature to suggest that the hydrocarbons themselves as they pass through, create a diagenesis front, which also causes the formation of magnetic minerals. So these framboids that we see are obviously too big to be uh, transported with the hydrocarbons. So 
because it's um, got a bit longer here, I thought I would just talk about our first attempt to do this, which wasn't particularly successful. And I'll tell you why it wasn't successful, and then I'll talk about a more successful study. So this Wessex Basin, which I discussed already, so this is where London is, and this is slightly down to the, the west of, uh, on the south coast of England to the west of London. And what we're interested in doing is, can we take cores, so can we take material from this uh, hydrocarbon system, determine the migration path independently using the magnetics, and then try and determine the migration path using uh, 3D seismic, uh, sorry, 3D basin modeling based on 3D seismic data. That's the kind of idea. So we get an independent estimate of migration, can the magnetics match up? That's what we're trying to do. Right, so the first thing we need to do is to get a location with core, and we was working. We were working on the Wessex Basin, so that was obviously the first place to that we thought we would try. And we're very lucky in the UK that I don't know since when, but it's the 60s or 70s. Every single core that's been drilled anywhere in the UK on land or offshore, half of it has to go. Half of the core has to go to the government, and it's stored at the British Geological Survey in Nottingham. And as an academic, we've got free access to all of this, so we can just book, go up, we can take samples. It's a fantastic resource. We're very lucky to have it. I know some other countries have this, but not all countries have this, this resource. And so we have a, a picture here. On the left, we have some sandstone, which was from not, uh, well, it's, it's uh, water wet, so there wasn't any oil on this. And you can see here we've got oil stains. You can see it looks very, very different. Okay, so this is our, so we go up there, we, we have all these different, um, these where the different cores and we get all this different material. This allows us to do, look at the, uh, uh, the magnetism. We also have to find an area where they've done the 3D uh, seismic data has been collected. And here's just showing you the 3D seismic data for this particular area that we're interested in. Now, later on, I'll be talking about how we get to the magnetic results, but we use a suite of magnetic tools, low temperature, high temperature. And for this particular study, I just want to jump straight into the results. Now, this was a particularly it was quite a hard, hard kind of study in trying to interpret the data. It was quite complex and uh, in places it was uh, quite difficult to interpret. But um, just taking the average of each of these particular cores, we're able to kind of get a trend for the general behavior. Now we'll be talking later on about how you get variations of magnetization along the core, but right here we're just talking about this sort of average behavior. So we, we think the oil is coming up. We know the oil is formed at Kimmeridge, it's coming up and then migrating to which farm. And we were kind of sure from the magnetics that it doesn't go through Bushy Farm that was previously thought and actually kind of went around it. Over in this region here we have, so this is the magnetite signal, the yellow is the pyrotite signal, the green is this mixed response. Over here it was quite complex and it was difficult to interpret. But anyway, we kind of thought for the magnetics, even though the result wasn't 100% clear, that there was some sort of migration path. So the idea is could we tie that in with the uh, 3D basin modeling. And this is the upheaval map uh, for the area. And uh, some of you are probably not very familiar with these things. I'm not going to go into great detail on the 3D basin modeling, but basically it's not a particularly, uh, it's not a particularly great example of an upheaval map. It, just, it was very complex and it was very difficult to do the modeling. And even though there's a hint of a migration path here, so this is the Kimmeridge where it's come up, and this is the bush, this is the witch farm where we think the where the oil reservoir is. Um, it wasn't very clear from the modelling, and unfortunately, it wasn't it wasn't good enough to be a control. And the reason for that is not so much in Rabu, who was a PhD student. It was more the fact, in his supervisors chose a location that probably wasn't the best place to test the theory on. So here we have the Wessex Basin. This is the area we're working in around about here, and it's very very complex. Lots of uh, inversions, anticlines, synclines. It was a very difficult place to work and probably not the best place to tr test our migration theory using magnetics. So we decided to try a simple locality, and this is with Shoppy's uh, PhD thesis, and we choose a place in the North Sea. And we've chosen this locality, the Tay Fan, which has a very linear system. So the oil is being formed over here, and then it migrates along in a straight line along this direction. So we've kind of got a relatively simple geology, we think, and we've got a nice linear simple system. So fill and spill chain. This is kind of what we thought we'd go to. 
And we've also got access to lots of 3D seismic data and good core coverage. So that was our reason for attempting this area. And uh, so here, just in a slightly more detail here, this is the oil is coming here, here in the south and moving along in this direction. And this is the schematic of what it originally looked like. So we're starting down here and the oil is migrating up the upper, along this upper tay fan up through here. Okay, and these are the various names of various oil fields in the, in the North Sea. Okay, so I'm going to show some seismic data, which you probably don't, you guys probably don't really look at very much. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's more just to show this is kind of the system we're looking at. And we started, we thought we had a nice linear system. So we started off looking at the 2D seismic models. Um, the idea is the oil forms over here and it moves up and migrates along here. Unfortunately, it was all getting stuck on this salt dome. And of course, the world isn't a 2D model, it's a 3D model. And rather than, we couldn't in the model get the oil to go over the salt dome, but of course in real world, it just goes around it, okay? So using a 2D model doesn't always work. So we had to resort to 3D models. And the 3D models is really quite a lot of work. And this is the work the students have done with their other supervisor, Al Fraser. I'm not gonna talk about the, the 3D basin modeling in great detail, just just gonna show you the results. Uh, it's a lot of work gone into these models. Um, here you can see this, this is the, the final model. I'm going to be talking about this later on, but this is just a starting point. So here we have the Tay sandstone. Here we have the predicted oil accumulations, and here we have the migration paths. This is what the 3D models allows us to do. And we are running these solutions now on the HPC. Just to show they're quite tricky to do, we're running them on the HPC facilities to, to actually get these uh, solved. So that's the... That's the sort of basic modeling aspect. And of course, we want to tie that in with the magnetics. And we do the whole range of the usual experiments, low temperature experiments. Um, now, the low temperature experiments, students have had limited access to MPMSs because we don't have an MPMS. We managed to get an MPMS in January 2019. And yesterday, our, the engineer from Quantum Design was there and he said it's working, but we've not had any data from it in 18 months. So it's been one big disappointment of getting the MPMS. Luckily, other people have been very, uh, other places around the world have been very helpful in letting us get access to their MPMS systems like ANU and IRM, et cetera. So the, the low temperature data is really crucial to try and understand what's going on. But as we all know, magnetic data doesn't rely on one particular measurement, relies on a whole range of different types of measurements. So we, we do a lot of high temperature measurements, high temperature susceptibility measurements, which can be difficult to interpret because the minerals are altering as we heat them up. We also do a lot of electron microscopy. Now, the, the magnetizations are relatively weak. They're down at um, parts per 100,000, maybe parts per million. So we can't really do electron microscopy work on the samples as they are. We have to do a magnetic extraction, which obviously potentially leads to issues because you may be not extracting all the magnetic minerals of interest. And then we're able to do some electron microscopy and we we're able to try and differentiate between gregite or, or pyrotite and identify minerals like pyrite, etc. So this is just, we've got hundreds of these uh, examples of, of measurements. We've also been doing fault measurements, but as the samples are particularly weak, it's quite difficult to get fault measurements so long with relatively incomplete data sets for the fault data, but just to show the kind of typical behavior that we get. And for this particular study, Shopee was able to um, summarize all the data. These are all the different minerals that we found. Um, we identified the origins, whether they're detrital, so they're there originally, whether they formed in the presence of hydrocarbons, um, and whether, so essentially, whether they're a background signal or a product of the hydrocarbons. We also get quite a lot of machemite. I, we suspect a lot of the machemite comes from the cores being stored in air for potentially 30 years, so those little magnetite particles get oxidized. Okay, so those are the kind of systems we're looking at. So the minerals that are particularly of interest are the siderite and the gregite, as we'll see in the next couple of slides. So when we plot them on a map, so this is our, the area that we're looking at before, the gray area marks the area where we have the 3D seismic data, that's just why that's just showing the 3D seismic data area. We have the, the wells, and each of the wells is different colors. So the dark red is the hydrocarbon producing wells. The, 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 the slightly brighter sort of reddy orange ones here 
these have got oil in them, but maybe not enough to actually go to full production. Then we have the dry well core. We've only got one of these. This just gives us our background signal. This is particularly important because we need to know the background signal of our rocks. Now, unfortunately, oil companies don't drill many background cores because they're looking for hydrocarbons. So generally speaking, you don't get many sort of dry wells. We do get these dry well cuttings sometimes, like up here, this yellow one. Unfortunately, these cuttings tend to be mixed up with drilling mud and stuff. So it's, they're often contaminated. So you can't really rely on the dry well cuttings. You really have to rely on the dry well core to get a fairly good background. So we think our background signal here is magnetite. Okay, so this is down here, this is magnetite here. So here we have the oil coming upwards. And we've kind of got, shop has kind of colored this according to the main mineralogy. So this area here is all kind of mostly dark green. So this means it's siderite, mostly. And as we move along here, we kind of start getting sort of equal numbers of, of uh, iron sulfides and siderite. And down here we've got much more iron sulfides. So that's kind of our, our trend. Now, let's just jump back to the 3D model. So our 3D model predicted these oil accumulations. Now, it didn't actually match what we see in the real world. And there was kind of a problem there. So um, Choppy was trying to, so Choppy was doing this at the same time. So it was kind of an iterative process. So not supposed to be done independently, but it's done by the same person. So clearly the person has got both data sets in their head. And what he noticed was is that we, a lot of siderite where we potentially might have vertical migration. So he associated the siderite with this vertical migration. So essentially when oil, as it rises up, you get decompression that releases uh, bicarbonate, which has the potential, potential to, to form, then they've got all this extra carbon oxygen, potential to, to form with the iron to form siderite. And you don't get that when you're doing lateral migration. So he associated with this with vertical migration and this iron suffers with, with um, horizontal or lateral migration. But there wasn't really, in the model itself, there wasn't really anywhere for this vertical migration to occur. So he went back and at the same time, another student, Marion, was just starting her PhD and she had in her course, in a similar region, very close to here, she had a lots of injectites. These are essentially bands of sandstone which are kind of have gone through um, the impermeable lab above which allow the oil to migrate. So now here's a picture of these injectites in the cores. Okay, and you can see the scale here. These are 10 centimeters or so, right? So the scale of this is probably less than a meter or a meter or less. Now the depth, the depth we're working at, the seismic resolution is about 10 meters. So essentially we've got all these little injectites that are too small to be seen with the seismics, but you can see them in the cores and the mineral magnetism is suggesting they should be there. So there's kind of a link there. And Choppy went back and he had a look at his seismic data in detail and he got hints of potentially some injectites in his seismic data. And that only came about because of the mineral magnetism. So the idea of having this independent technique, we ended up using the magnetism to help interpret and fully interpret the 3D model. So he put the injectites in, built his 3D model. So put the injectites into the 3D model and lo and behold, they got something that matches more what's going on in reality. So that was, rather than using the 3D basin to test, test the, the, the mineral magnetic migration theory, we end up using the mineral, migra mineral magnetic migration sort of ideas to fine tune the, the basin model, which was very pleasing for me. Um, so here's kind of a summary of what was going on, back to our 2D case. So here we have the, the injectites over here, we have this migration going up here, this forms all the siderite, we saw the, the predominant magnetic signal is siderite in all these cores. And as it transports along, we tend to get less siderite, more iron sulfide. So we get all the way over here, as we, the oil creeps through here, we end up with a, a much more gregite or iron sulfide-like signal. Now, you might say lateral migration is purely gives an iron sulfide signal, but also we're running into this area where it's getting quite shallow. So now we need to start thinking of biodegradation. So as I said before, biodegradation happens due to bacteria at relatively shallow depths or relatively cool temperatures below 80 degrees Celsius. 
So over here, we've got the oil vertical migration forming our siderite. And as it comes through here, it's coming into the zone where we're starting getting lots of iron sulfides. But we also, this red here is an indication of the, so I should mention this, this map here is a, is a graph, is the API gravity. And the API gravity is very strongly correlated with the level of biodegradation. So here we've, over the blue, we've got no uh, biodegradation or very low biodegradation. And where it's red, we've got lots of biodegradation. It's a very crude way of getting the, the biodegradation level. And you can see that we've got the lots of iron sulfides when it's lots of biodegradation. So is it due to lateral migration or is it due to biodegradation? Now, unfortunately, before that, we had another student, Stacy, who looked a lot at biodegradation in her, in her uh, thesis. And she got samples from various places around the world. Um, so we've got the, we've got the Alberta tar sands, Columbia, uh, Columbia, Indonesia, and the UK. And she did the usual magnetic analysis. And I'm running over time here a little bit. Uh, but she also did a lot of uh, organic uh, geochemistry. So looking at um, Fourier transform and Fourier spectroscopy and gas chromatography to try and quantify the oil in these samples and trying to understand the levels of biodegradation. These graphs, for some reason, never have units on. There's always response versus retention time. I've asked the, the organic geochemists why they never put units on. They said, well, there aren't any units. And I've never got a clear answer to what the units are. But so, so before anyone criticizes me for no units, I would also like to know where the units are on this particular graph. Um, this allows us to plot the samples in a sort of biodegradation plot. There's various ways of measuring the biodegradation. We can see there's various samples from the various localities from over here where there's almost no biodegradation to very high levels of biodegradation. Uh, the analysis uh, of so for Stacy for her work, she did a lot of electron microscopy and we saw a lot of these framboids. We also saw evidence for Microbe activity, I mean, she associated this with biodegradation and there is, is some evidence for it, but I think the biodegradation is really happening on a much smaller scale than, than we're looking at in this particular crystal here, which is quite a large crystal. And she was able to come up with a very nice graph. So we've got the two, two independent ways of measuring biode biodegradation. And these graphs are essentially the same, even though they're plotted, they look contrasting. So the levels of biodegradation on the left one are going up as we go this way, and on the, the right-hand side, it's going down. And along here, we have the magnetic susceptibility. So if we just look at the one on the left here. So as biodegradation increases, this log, because this is minus, is 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, the magnetization is decreasing, right? So higher biodegradation, um, lower magnetization. And she was interested in tying this in to the... Uh, to this idea of doing aeromagnetic surveys. So she, uh, the idea that we came up with is a biodegradation leads to preferential removal of the smaller magnetic particles. So what we found was that the grain size distribution also sifts. So even though we reduce the magnetization, it's the very small particles are the ones that are removed first, preferentially leaving the larger particles. Now, in the work that she did, she came up with lots of all her work suggested that the particles that were left over were magnetized. And in the work that was done by Shopee, it, it came, came across that we actually ended up with lots of iron sulfide. So there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction there. However, I think this probably depends a lot exactly at the depth of which the biodegradation is happening. Um, as you can see here from a paper from Andrew Roberts, you can see that depending exactly where we are on this graph, whether in the sort of sulfide reduction zone or the iron reduction zone, we're going to get a different response. So I think with, in the light of the work that, of Shopee's PhD thesis, we need to go back and revisit the biodegradation work that we did with Stacy so many years ago. So to be continued. Now I realize I kind of run over time, so um, I'm just gonna skip. This is no point, not so quite so important. This is just about some of the micromagnetic modeling we've done on framboids that we see. And then I also, we also find this at the fluid water contacts, uh, so the oil water contacts and the gas contacts, we often get this spike in the magnetization. 
Um, so you go down the core, you get these spikes, and we're able to identify the contacts using um, other techniques like looking at things like porosity. And we are still trying to kind of come get a coherent method for explaining how uh, why you get this enhancement. So I'm just going to go through those. So just to wrap it up. So normally I would leave a slide with conclusions, but I thought I would leave the finishing slide to talk about the work that we're currently doing. So we've still got three PhD students, actually still, we've got three PhD students working in this area. So we're trying to look at, can uh, magnetic migration work, the analysis that we've done, does it work on a reservoir scale? So we've kind of done it on a large scale hydrocarbon system, but can we do it on an individual reservoir scale? That's something Mariam's working on. We have another PhD student, Joe, and he's looking at, um, in the Murray Firth and he's got oil from different sources and can we use a mineral magnetism to try and identify where the oil has come from. Now we've done a lot of work looking at clastic systems or so sandstones and we want to see if we can apply some of the things we've learned to carbonates. And then again there's this oil water contact thing which I touched on at the very end. Can we use this, these oil water contacts to identify paleo contacts if there's been tilting of the reservoir and things like that. Can we can we use uh, our knowledge of the magnetic signal to do that? Okay, thanks very much for that. That's the end of the talk. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adrian. That was a really, really interesting talk. And we can all thank Adrian uh, via our virtual applause button. Um, that was really good. Um, I'm sure we probably have a few questions. Um, I can actually jump in uh, now with a question that we got in the chat uh, while you were talking. And this was from uh, William Harbit, Harbit um, who asked, how could reactive geochemical processes, including these magnetic phases, impact and change the uh, formation permeability? Sorry, can you say the, so, uh, um, the formation permeability? Yeah, so essentially... I, I, I think, I, I suspect that most of the magnetic minerals will not make much difference to the permeability. The only one that might do is is the siderite because the siderite tends to cement and we're trying to get a handle on how much siderite there is there. So most of the magnetic minerals that we see, um, the concentrations are very low. They're down in parts per 100,000, parts per million. Whereas the siderite is at a slightly higher concentration. We think maybe maybe one or two percent. So that could you're right, that could reduce the permeability of the rocks. We haven't actually something we haven't really looked into, but yeah, that's potentially an effect that we should consider. With, with the, I mean, how prevalent are the framboids um, with respect to the smaller particles? Um, they are, it's one of those things, you look down an electron microscope and you, you get drawn to the big fancy framboids because they look nice and they're a nice picture. But I think, and it's hard to do proper quantitative analysis on, on the electron microscope because the concentration of the magnetic particles is so low, and we've done a magnetic extract as well. So it's really hard to quantify them, but I would say they're not particularly abundant. I would say we do see, there's more individual particles just kind of dotted around, and the framboids, though they are pretty and nice to look at, um, there's probably less of them. Um, yeah. So they're probably not that common. Yeah. And one thing we did with the modeling was to show that you really need a lot, because the, they essentially give a multi-domain light signal, they, you really need a lot of framboids to actually um, dominate a magnetic signal of a, a sample. You, you, know, you don't need that many single domain particles or single vortex particles, individual particles, to dominate the, the, the response on a fork diagram. Cool. Um, so we have time for a few more questions. Well, I'll, I'll I'll throw out one one more um, on the uh, the part where you, you did have to go over a little bit quickly, where you see this spike in the magnetization at the the interfaces. Um, this is the oil water interface, I assume. Yeah, that's the oil. Yeah, water contact. So, what um, what do you think is causing that uh, spike? Well, if I just share my screen again, actually, we've got a model. Uh, Uh, let me just 
So um, when we did fork analysis across that, I mean, we, we have a very few samples and we did PCA analysis. And if Dave has lots of things, he'll probably tell me off for doing PCA analysis with so few points. But um, you can, you don't really need to do PCA. You can see quite clearly the fork diagrams actually at the contact themselves are very, very different to the sort of background signal. So I know it's not the best fork diagram, but because the samples are very weak. But um, you can see there's a quite distinct uh, population of slightly larger grains than what you see in the sort of general background signal. And we came up with some models. And one of the models we came up with is that the particles are formed at the top and then they kind of drop down and they drop down and kind of get stuck on the, on the oil water contact layer. And it's not really a sharp contact, it's more of a, a zone. Um, another idea that's not actually in here is I, I kind of, I'm quite in favor of the idea that there's, um, at this particular zone, you've got lots of hydrocarbons and you've also got suddenly you're mixing with all this water. So you've got a different chemistry, some different kind of chemistry. And we were, I'm quite keen to do some thermodynamic modeling of the exact conditions that you get at this context. I think it's something that's just being formed due to you know these optimum conditions at the particular at this contact or so something being formed in situ rather than in this model here where we've got these little particles essentially falling out onto the contact itself. Excellent. So uh, we have uh, time for another quick question from anyone. Okay. Well, I've got a quick question. There uh, if I may. Yeah. On you go, Richard. So. Um, yeah, Adrian, at the start, there was all sorts of nice things about how this was going to help in the um, utilization of, um, you know, um, mature oil fields. Um, so do you think you really have something to say on that? Uh, I think so. I think... Um the stuff on the wall water contacts is quite new. And I think that might help. I think this vertical and lateral migration is something that hasn't really been, uh, has never been done before. Um, and if we can use the techniques to do that, um, to identify, to help the, the basic modeling, then um, there is a potential to, to link that up with uh, various uh, companies. And we have given these presentations to a number of oil companies and they have shown interest to a certain degree but it hasn't been taken up fully but there is an interest in the sort of work that we're doing um so yeah i mean especially in places like the north sea i think there's a scope for this yeah because it's a very mature um system but yeah we haven't made the jump yet between what we've been doing and actually implementing it in in a commercial sense and a lot of the stuff that we've just done with the i think the most exciting thing is this difference between the vertical and lateral migration um this work has only really come out and you know it's not even published yet it's still accepted or in press or mm -hmm. so yeah yeah sounds like an industrial case student to me yeah uh well we have we are i mean as i said um al fraser this one of the guys i work with he has been working in industry for 30 years, so he has a lot of contacts. So he's quite, he's very well connected and knows um, who to talk to about trying to uh, use what we've learned and actually apply it rather than just to, you know, publish papers. To mm. Well, publishing papers is not bad either. But, no, uh, but uh, hopefully some of the stuff can actually, uh, can eventually can, can benefit uh, recovery and things. It would be good to get our oil from... Um, as you said, areas which are already being explored and not have to go and dig up new places. Yeah. Uh, so we have one one other last question that's in the chat from Sue, uh, and she was just asking, is there enough magnetite for a magnetic signature at the surface? And um, is there, how does that compare to the sort of 4D gravity surveys? Is there enough to get at the surface? I mean, I, we an, an anomaly that, signature. We would love there to be a magnetic anomaly, but we're talking about samples that we are um, struggling to measure in a squid magnetometer. So the answer is not really significant levels 
you know, some of the nuances that we're seeing, not getting these very high levels that would lead to clear magnetic anomalies at the surface. Um, there might be scenarios where you do have that, but in, in the systems we've been looking at, the concentrations have been quite low. Um, um, How does this compare with 4D gravity, or it could also be 4D seismic surveys? Um, I don't really have an answer to, to the gravity surveys. Um, as I said, the magnetization, the, the concentration of looking at is so small. So even though we've got magnetic particles there, the, the concentration is so small, it doesn't probably really add significantly to any density that you're going to pick up in a gravity survey, I wouldn't have thought. Um, we've been trying to, we, you know, we've not been thinking of gravity or seismic surveys. We've been thinking of can we actually um, relate this to, you know, an aeromagnetic survey would be the obvious thing. But then we were thinking more if this was going to be used, it would be used more at the level of people collecting um, cores and analyzing cores. That's the sort of level we're looking at just because the concentrations are quite low. I, I'm not sure is my mic working? Yes, Can you hear yes. me? Oh, okay, sorry. No, I was talking about the, the 4D gravity surveys where people are, are tracking the migration of the oil interface. And I, I'm just wondering if that um, has been, I guess it hasn't been looked at with the mag because the concentration is too low. But I'm thinking of the squid magnetometers that we're, you know, we're using in South Africa on airborne flights. Um, it, it's um, just well, very uh, speculative. Uh, so in, in Imperial, we do a lot of, we have a big group working on 4D science, so I guess it's very similar to the, the 4D gravity service. And they do see the migration. No, we haven't, we haven't tried to link that together, and it's something we probably could do uh, working with people in, yeah, who do do the well, do 4D seismic, but it's a similar sort of idea, trying to track migration. We haven't tried to, to link that together. We've been doing this 3D data and then using um, a suite of Schlumberger uh, programs to predict the migration paths. That's our, been our policy. But yeah, I think maybe trying to tie this in with some 4D data would probably be a good idea and something we haven't explored yet, but maybe we should do. I yeah, still sounds, think- Sounds very interesting, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I really would like it to be able to, you know, use a squid and squid magnetometer and fly it behind uh, a plane and pick up the magnetic anomalies due to this. And maybe on very large scale features, you can see that, but there's sort of the, the kind of smaller features that we've been looking at, you know, there's great depths looking at features, which, you know, these injectites, which are, you know, quite small. Um, we're not, I, the magnetization really is quite low. I, just, I think it's going to be difficult to apply this routinely to, um, in, a, in some sort of aeromagnetic survey or even a, a drone survey, which is you know, obviously much closer. I think it obviously depends as well on the depth of the hydrocarbons, of course. And a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at in the North Sea is, um, you know, it's under several kilometers of water and under several kilometers of rock. So, you know, we're quite a long way from the source if we're, you know, doing a survey of, of, some, sort of, of, of some sort of survey. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, we will wrap it up for today. So I want to uh, thank Adrian once again um, for a really interesting talk. And just before uh, we all go, just a quick, um, a quick reminder that the seminars um, are available online um, through uh, the YouTube channel, the Magic YouTube channel. So thank you again to um, Earth and the Magic team for hosting that for us. Um, and in the coming uh, weeks and months, we have uh, several, several more speakers lined up. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you all again here uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and as always, uh, I want to, uh, you're welcome. Uh, any feedback, uh, comments and criticisms, uh, please just drop us a, an email uh, with any thoughts. And thank you once again, everybody, for uh, joining us today for another Magnet Seminar. Thank you. Thanks.